just imagine for a second that you're mixing a track in your room, maybe you finish the mix, you export it into another project to master it, and it's sounding something like this. Sounding pretty good. You take it out to the car, and now it sounds like this. Now that's a pretty radical difference. Let's compare again. But I think that's pretty close to the difference that you can hear when you take your mix into a different environment. And maybe it's not your car, maybe it's somewhere else. But this is based on an EQ curve of a real room. I took this from a student because we get all of our students to measure their room. And I replicated the curve of their room and there was a 9.8 decibel boost at 150 hertz. There was also a 6 dB cut. And you can see up to 12 decibels boost or cut when you measure your room. So what that means is if you're listening to your mix in your room, you could be hearing certain frequencies as much as 12 decibels out. And this is an actual room curve. So in the room, it would sound like this. And you think it sounds great, but you're actually 12 dB out on various different frequencies. So in the car, it sounds completely different. So this is obviously extremely demoralizing when this happens. And this is just an example, right? Obviously it's kind of different because car speakers all sound different and different environments and all that kind of stuff. But just to give you a really clear example of how much of a discrepancy that can be. And it's really demoralizing because you spend all of this time mixing the track in your room and it sounds great, but then in the car it just falls flat. It's really frustrating. And really it's just kind of the moment where you actually realize that, okay, I actually have a lot more work here to do than I thought. So there are a few reasons why this happens. First of all, it's your room. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. It's also managing perspective. So this is really important. It's also training your ears. And finally, you need to have more of an end in mind perspective. So they're the next four things that we're gonna talk about. And actually, over the span of this, um, this video, let me just tell you all of the things that we're gonna cover. So we're also gonna talk about not using band-aids and treating root problems. We're gonna talk about balancing and volume balancing being 80% of the mix. We're gonna talk about volume automation, referencing, workflow, mixing fast, EQ, and something specifically called intent-based EQ, which is what I think is the only way to approach EQ. Fearless compression is something we're gonna to touch on. Clipping limiting, mixing in 4D. Um, should you or shouldn't use the solo button? Should you top down mix, high pass filter? Should you mix in mono? Do magic frequencies work? Do you need to gain stage your mix? There's a lot of misunderstanding around that. We're gonna talk about the difference between objective and subjective music production. And we're gonna get really clear on what's actually holding you back from achieving the stand in your head. So that's all to come. But for now, let's dig into treating your room. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, you can see here already, I've demonstrated how much of a difference this can make. If your room isn't tuned, it's gonna make your life so much more difficult. Of course, you can use headphones to mitigate that. And ideally you want as flat headphones as possible. These are the Order Z LCDX. They're pretty expensive, but they're amazing. I love them. I spend a lot of time mixing on these. The downside of mixing on headphones is you don't get the cross referencing between the speakers and that sounds different. So all your panning is gonna sound different when you're listening to speakers and you can actually hear the left speaker with your right ear and the right speaker with your left ear. Whereas when you're mixing on headphones, it's completely isolated. But nowadays, a lot of people do listen on headphones. So you definitely wanna be using them, but you need a room that's treated as well because really it's both. You can use headphones, but you also wanna um, listen to music in your room if you want to actually get to a really professional level. So without going too deep into the process of um, actually applying room treatment, the first thing that you wanna look at is first reflection points. So just to the left and the right of your speakers, above you on the ceiling, and another one that a lot of people forget as well is actually the desk. That's the initial reflection point. If you imagine all of the surfaces around you were mirrors, where would you actually be able to see your speakers? They're the reflection points. And that's the first thing you wanna treat with some absorption, absorption panels, not, um, you know, not foam or anything like that, proper broadband panels. And then the other thing is bass trapping. 
So if you get those two things down, you're already, you know, that's pretty much it. And then diffusion at the back room, all that kind of stuff isn't as important. And then finally, you want to make sure speakers are in the right position as well. So I'm not going to go into that a ton right now. I've already demonstrated how much of a difference that can make. And if your mixes aren't translating well to other places, that'll be a big part of why. The next thing is managing your perspective. So it's it's really, really important to manage perspective. And if you've ever got halfway through a mix and you start to think, man, I don't know if any of this even sounds any good. I don't know what I'm doing. It happens all the time. And that means you've lost perspective. So there's a few really important things you need to do to manage that. You need to take lots of breaks. Ideally, when you take those breaks, get out of your room and actually you know, get into an environment that has some sounds in it. So walk out to the street or just walk around your house. Sometimes I walk around the house and I just like click my fingers, clap my hands. So I get used to like the sound of a normal environment and listen to some music on different speakers, stuff like that. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but on your breaks, just try and get out there and like reset your ears and just get in a normal environment. And equally having a break, not listening to music is going to kind of reset your perspective. But then when it comes to um, when you're actually mixing, use different speaker systems, switch between headphones to speakers, switch between multiple speaker systems. Again, that's going to constantly give you different perspective and reset your perspective using reference tracks as well. So when you're, you know, deep in a mix and you're, again, you're not sure if you're making it better or worse, you can use reference tracks to kind of um, pull you back to that more objective standard, use it as a measuring stick. And then also don't spend too long on one thing in a mix. If you spent 10 minutes mixing the snare, it can get really tricky to maintain perspective and you lose the perspective of the broader mix. So you have to constantly move from one place to another. And I actually quite like to go from one place to somewhere completely different. So if I've mix, been mixing the snare, maybe then I'll go and do some mix bus processing and then I'll do some backing vocals and then I'll do guitar and then I'll do a vocal rather than going vocal, 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 lead vocal. Uh, sorry, backing vocals and, and doing that. Or instead of doing like EQ lead vocal, compressed lead vocal, limit lead vocal, blah, 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 blah. I'll EQ the lead vocal. Then I'll go and EQ the snare or something else. And then I'll come back to the lead vocal later. So you can move around the mix more and it kind of helps you manage your perspective. So that's really important. Tip number four is to train your ears. So I'm going to give you another quick demonstration here. I'm going to enable this EQ and I've boosted a certain frequency. I'm not going to show you what it is, but on this EQ here, I've boosted a certain frequency. And I want you to just listen and try and guess what it is. Just try and guess. Okay, I can make it a little bit more accentuated, but to do that, I'm going to have to open the plugin so you'll see what frequency is. So if you can guess roughly what frequency that is, and you don't even need to guess the exact frequency, but have a rough idea of what happened there. Even if you can just differentiate between, you know, did I boost the bass, the mids or the highs? That's the starting point. So then it's bass, low mids, high mids or highs. Then it's picking exact frequencies. But if you have no idea what frequency is being boosted there, then that's a sign that you really need to train your ears because that's the point you need to get to. You have to be able to hear certain frequencies. And instead of a lot of people I find they use kind of a lack of hearing or, or um, critical listening as a crutch. And they say, well, I can't even hear the difference. So what's the point? I'm never gonna be good at this. You know, engineers have golden ears, all this kind of stuff. But how do you think they got there? It's just practice. So instead of using it as a crutch, lean into it and just do the practice. Use a service like Sound Gym, which is an incredible service. Um, our students inside the reverse engineer get a discount on this. We partner with these guys a lot because we love their service. Like I use this and all of our students use this and it allows you to just go in and do exercises that help you train your ears every single day. So one last listen, see if you can guess the frequency. Okay, so one kilohertz. So we can make this even more exaggerated. You can, I hear that as like nasally. Oh, I kind of hear that as nasally. That's, you, you start to associate these frequencies with 
um, different kind of sounds and you start to get an idea of how this sounds on a vocal um, and you know one kilohertz for example is a really important range on the lead vocal and you, you get to know that so train your ears it's really important if you couldn't tell at all or had no idea what even ballpark that frequency was in then it's a good sign that you need to train your ears mixing tip number five is end in mind perspective so if you don't have clarity on where you're going, it's going to be really difficult to know how to get there. That applies to anything. And when we relate this back to the car test, um, it's, you know, we're starting to go a little bit broader here. This isn't just the car test. This is generally a good principle to follow. But if you don't know what you're trying to achieve and you can't translate that into very tangible terms, like I, you know, I know roughly what the balance I, w I want to be between the different instruments. I know if I want this to be quite a low end heavy track or not. I, I want this to be quite dynamic and punchy, or I want this to be like thick and heavy and translate kind of an idea or a vision for a production into kind of technical sonic terms. If you can't do that, you're just gonna be all over the place. You don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, then anywhere will get you there and you'll just end up all over the place and eventually you might get to the end result um, but you know it would have created a lot of deviation if you have complete clarity on where you're going though then it's as simple as going from a to b so you need to have that end in mind perspective and i think this is why a lot of people are struggling especially uh, kind of intermediates and that intermediate plateau they don't know where they're going wrong and they don't know why they don't know what they're missing and I think it's because they can't translate that vision into technical terms. Or another way of putting it is the, the end um, goal isn't clear enough to them. And often that's because they haven't spent a lot of time mastering, which is the last phase of the process. And if you haven't spent a lot of time mastering music, then you don't really have clarity on what the goal is in sonic terms. And you're not working with the end of the process as much. Instead, if you're constantly producing and you're writing new tracks and you're recording new tracks and you're producing new tracks, but you never take them through the entire mixing and mastering process, you're spending all of your time in the beginning of the process. So it's really hard to know how the end looks. So until you have complete clarity on the end, um, it's gonna be difficult. So that's important. The next tip is don't use band-aids. So you don't wanna try and fix a mix in the master and you don't wanna try and fix poor recordings or poor choice of samples or virtual instruments in the mixing process. You wanna go back to the root of the cause and treat it there. And that basically means you just need to make sure you're doing your job as you go through each phase. And then once you have that level of quality, balancing is 80% of it. Because if you've got really good tracks to start with, then once you get the balance going, it really doesn't need much as opposed to you're going in and trying to fix issues on every single channel and you're trying to cut this and remove that and fix that. And you kind of want to think of it that the fate of your mix is already decided by the time you pull up the faders and start mixing. And if the mix is only you know four out of 10 when you get the volume balance done, it's gonna be extremely difficult, if not impossible to get to even like a seven or an eight out of 10. And the kind of the best potential mix inside of those raw recordings or raw multi-tracks has already been decided. The fate has already been sealed. Whereas if you pull up the faders and you've got really good recordings, really good samples, really good virtual instruments, and it's just kind of a seven or an eight out of 10 just with volume balancing, you're gonna be able to get to that 10 out of 10 point. So you wanna start really high quality material and then focus on the volume balance because once you've got quality material, that is just 80% of what we do in the mixing process is just making sure everything's at the right volume. And if you go and watch any YouTube video where you know a mixer pulls up a Grammy winning track and there's various videos you can do that, it just sounds great straight away. And equally, I've heard so many you know, interviews with different mix engineers um, and mixed by Ali. He mixes all of Kendrick Lamar's stuff. And he talks about how like he spends the most of his time just doing the volume balance and also doing volume auto automation, which we're gonna come back to in a second. But to demonstrate this, I've got some, some tracks here. They're pretty good sounding recordings. And this is just a volume balance nothing else there is some kind of mix prep so normally what i do is i go through each channel i check if it needs some gain staging if it's guitars or basses i'll play around with some amp simulation and i'll do all of this before i start mixing and i i do all of it in solo as well so i'm not even listening to the whole mix and then on the vocal i've also got my um kind of dynamic processing already i'm going to come back to that later as well so that's all we've got and a volume balance let's have a listen So 
it sounds pretty good already. That's with nothing else. And we're going to keep working on this track as we go through um, this session. But just wanted to demonstrate that. So the next tip is that don't ne you can't neglect volume automation. So it, following on from the last tip, if volume balance is 80% of the mix, then volume automation is how you make sure that the volume balance is perfect throughout the mix because it's not static. We've got kind of two, um, two dimensions to consider. One is the balance at any one snapshot in time. What's the balance between the different instruments? But then you have a whole track and at each point you could take a snapshot and look at the balance and it could be you know, better or worse. And maybe the balance needs to be different in the verse to the chorus. So the only way you can actually get the volume balance exactly where you need it is by using volume automation to adjust the balance as you go through the song. So to show you an example of this, I've got a track here, it's a kind of an electronic track. And especially with electronic music, when it's well produced and you've, um, you know, you've got lots of good sounding samples and, and synths and that kind of stuff, it doesn't need a ton of mixing. It's not like you've got dry guitar recordings or dry drums where you're having to like do loads of gating and EQ and compression to even just get everything to sit well together. Because everything's been produced digitally, it already sounds great. So even more so, the majority of what you're doing is just volume balancing. So if we have a listen here during the chorus, um, let's just see kind of where everything sits. So let's focus on these snaps. So I like how they're sitting in this last chorus. And they're kind of working together with the claps. But then if we turned off the automation on this track, listen to how they sound in this earlier verse. They're pretty loud, and especially if we sum to mono. They're kind of distracting from the vocal. So all I've done is I've used volume automation to turn them down a little bit in this verse. So now they're just kind of keeping time in the background. This part, there's no other rhythm going on. So I don't want it to be like really rhythmic. It's actually the opposite. We've got this like long drawn out bass synth and I want to shift all of the focus to the vocal. If anything, I want it to feel arrhythmic and just kind of mellow. And it's a nice break from the section before. So I want the snap in there, and that's why it's in there from a production um, standpoint, but I don't want it to be the main thing. I don't want it to pull focus from the vocal. It's just kind of keeping time in the background. So that's just one example, but if you look through here, and honestly, this is not a ton of volume automation compared to what I would normally do. This is not a finished mix, so there's a lot more to come. But you can already see where it's just turning things up and down at different points um, to make sure it's sitting in the mix perfectly. Here's some examples here as well where the synths kind of turn down and then come up into the chorus. So just don't think of the volume balance as a static thing. It's highly dynamic and you need to make sure it's right at all the different parts um, of the song. Okay, mixing tip number nine is progressive referencing. So when you start out, you wanna reference a lot more aggressively and you can even play around with copying. So actually pulling up a track and thinking, how do I copy this? How do I break this down and replicate it? Because through doing that, you're gonna practice everything. It's going to force you to reverse engineer something and have a clear vision that you're working towards and a and really easy measuring stick to constantly compare to. And if you try and copy it, it's going to force you to, it's going to, going to kind of simplify things because now you don't have to 
decide on your own vision, which is can, can be really difficult. Instead, you can just use someone else's vision and now you only have to focus on sound design and shaping and mixing and all those things. And when you're a beginner, I think that's a really helpful exercise. And generally, uh, when you're newer to this, you wanna lean on referencing more heavily. So even if you're not trying to copy as kind of a practice exercise, and you don't necessarily wanna do that when you're actually producing your own music, uh, do it more as a practice exercise. But then even when you're not trying to copy, you can lean more aggressively on references. And in that case, you wanna use three to five references so that you're not tempted to copy, but you wanna just constantly check them very, very frequently. Every you know five, 10 minutes, like go through and compare to references or every little decision. If you're thinking, hmm, I'm not sure how loud my snare should be, listen through your references and you know focus on the snare. So for every decision, you can reference your references. And then as you get better, and this is kind of the, the progressive aspect to this, you want to reference less so when you're intermediate you're referencing less and less and then when you get to an advanced level by that point you should know your room you should know your headphones and you get better at just kind of trusting your internal kind of judgment of how things should sound and instead you you're still using references but you use them at the start of the mix just to kind of like tune in your ears or you know if you've been out of the studio and then you come in and sit in the studio to do some mixing you kind of listen to some music to just kind of tune your ears in and then and then do a mix and then maybe you check references halfway through the mix again and then maybe you check them at the end but that's basically it so as you get better you lose you use references less there's no kind of one piece of advice that works for every single skill level okay now mixing tip number 10 is that any workflow works there's a bunch of different approaches to mixing some people talk about top-down mixing which is where you um you start with a lot of kind of processing on the mix bus. So you start from the top, if you think of the top as the stereo track. So you get your volume balance and then you do you know, mix bus processing and then you do like your subgroup. So I would start on the mix bus and then maybe I'd do all of my you know, drum bus, bass bus. So you're kind of going from the top down. There's other approaches. People say you should start with the vocals in solo, mix the vocals and then bring everything else around them. Other people say the opposite. They say mix it like an instrumental, then bring the vocals in on top. There's so many different workflows, but anyone will work. All of them work, none of them work. It's, yeah, it's completely dependent on you. There is no right answer. What I prefer to do now, as I've kind of gone through this process and I've tried out all these different workflows and I've you know, approached these things from, having a kind of framework what i find is it actually boxes me in sometimes and i started to use different workflows for different tracks and then i realized well you know what there's there's not actually a set workflow here and that can be tricky because it, it's really difficult when you're learning and it's such a kind of overwhelming process and such a complex process and it's so interdependent as well when you're mixing it's like you change one thing over here and something else over here changes so it's it's really hard to systemize that and you need to think of it more as you know, painting a, a work of art. And I'm not a painter, so I don't know <laughs> if there is a workflow, but I imagine it's more kind of emotion led. It's more, you're kind of chipping away at different parts or, or it's like sculpting a statue. You're not necessarily gonna, you know, sculpt the arm perfectly and then sculpt the head perfectly. You go through lots of different passes. First, you get the rough outline, then you go a, a you know, slightly higher level of detail and then you go more and more detailed. And at the end, you're just kind of fine tuning and you're like chiseling the eyes or something like that. So, it's overwhelming because that's kind of amorphous, but in the long term, it's better if you think of mixing that way. And the way I approach it now is I just throw up the faders, I get a volume balance going, and the order that you do that doesn't really matter. If you want, you can start with the vocal or you just throw them all up. It's, yeah, it doesn't really matter. But once you've got the volume balance going, what I prefer to do is just see what grabs my attention first and start solving problems. So if we listen to this track here, um, that is just a volume balance that we listened to earlier. Let's see you know, what grabs our attention. And if we're struggling to decide you know, what to work on first or nothing's grabbing our attention or we're struggling to identify problems that need solving, that's when we can go back to references, compared to references, and then it should be pretty obvious pretty quickly what problems we need to solve. So let's just go and 
pick some random references. Um, I should go for anything on here. So it's already sounding pretty good. And I often find that this is the most difficult point, sometimes of the whole mix. It's when you get the volume balance done and then you take a break and you come back and you think, where do I start? And it's like, you know, writing something and you have a blank sheet of paper. A lot of people are afraid of, you know, the blinking cursor and you've got nothing. So you just kind of, I find you just kind of have to start. And then very quickly, you'll start to notice like problem after problem after problem after problem. So here, the thing that's grabbing my attention the most as just kind of irritating me. Thing that's grabbing my attention the most is actually that the snare is you know not sitting in the balance very well and i find this is often the case the first thing that comes to my attention is imbalances referring back to this idea that the volume balance is 80 percent of it there's all these kind of offshoots of that one is that therefore volume automation is really important but another thing is you know compression because if something's all over the place and one second it's really loud and then it's really quiet that's kind of a you know subcategory of volume or it's like a you know volume on a, a micro scale as opposed to a macro scale so i do often find that the first thing that grabs my attention is you know a lack of dynamic consistency in something and then i'll reach for a compressor and i'll start shaping that and then that will help me get the volume balance sitting better and just kind of locking everything into place so that's the thing that grabs my attention here we're actually not going to do that first but i just wanted to walk you through that process if you get really stuck just start going through the channels one by one. Just go to the vocal and just think, what does the vocal need? You know, tonally, compression, like what does it need? Just start working on it. And then as you're listening to the mix, you'll start to just like hear all of these different problems and you'll start to get uh, more clarity on, on what to work through. And then if you're, again, if you get stuck at any point and think, I don't really know what to do next, just kind of go to the next, you know, pick a channel, say the snare and focus just on the snare. And as soon as you start focusing on these different elements, then it can start to become more obvious and you think oh actually yeah there's some issues there that I need to fix that you, could, you couldn't really notice when you were listening to the mix on the whole so mixing tip number 11 is to mix fast so this comes back to the idea of managing perspective but i find a lot of people are mixing way too slow and it means that they're overthinking it instead of just relying on intellect and doing what the mix needs and what the mix is telling them it needs they're overthinking things they're spending too long on one thing or another and they're, they're then losing that perspective and that's why it's a race against the clock because the longer you mix the the more you lose that perspective so a really easy way to do this is just get like a, a little you know three minute timer or, or even a one minute timer depending on what you're doing you know one minute three minutes but set a timer say okay this snare the tone is off i want to mess with that i want to actually like eq it and then flip the timer and say i'm just going to give myself three minutes to do it and whatever i'm at at three minutes that's it and the other knock-on impacts of this that's really really important is it forces you to be a lot more intentional so instead of just playing around with stuff and thinking yeah, okay, what, what should I be doing? Um, instead, it forces you to actually just listen to the mix, look for those problems, decide what you're gonna do before you do it, rather than just pulling up plugins and playing around. And then you can, you know, it, only, it should only take you one or two or three minutes to actually do the thing. If you've identified the snare sounds a little bit dull, I think it needs more upper mids, probably around three kilohertz then it should only take you 30 seconds to a minute to pull up an EQ and do that. And using a timer is a, is a really easy way to kind of force your hand there. And that ties really nicely into mixing tip number 12, which is intent-based EQ. And this is the idea of having an intention before you reach for an equalizer. A lot of people do kind of load up an EQ 
and sweep around. So if we pick the vocal, for example, right now there's only some dynamic processing on the vocal. There's nothing else. So you'd be tempted to say, okay, well, I don't, I don't really know. I'm not sure what the vocal needs. Let's just play around. I'm just gonna sweep around and find some frequencies that sound good or bad. Bell, give me a ransom to leave. You might do something like that. Oh, you know, it sounded a bit boomy, so I'm gonna cut it there instead. But often what you end up doing is just making things sound different, not more in line with the vision that you have for the mix or for the song. So there is no right or wrong, and we're gonna come back to that idea later on because it's really important. Often the direction that you're going is based on either references and just what is a good overall sonic balance, what is you know a general consensus of a professional sounding track, but also emotion. How do you want this track to impact the listener emotionally? And that can help guide your decisions. Now, if you just sweep around with an EQ or you don't have a clear intention, then you're not really doing either of those things. So you either identify there's a problem here sonically in that something sounds just kind of crappy <laughs> and it you know, sounds really muddy or you know, something like that. So then you can say, okay, well, what's the problem? It sounds really muddy. Uh, you know, what do I need to cut? And then you know, you know, if you do ear training and all that kind of stuff, you know that muddiness is probably gonna be around like three to 500 Hertz. And you might even be able to hear it. So if we solo this vocal, but give me a reason to leave, bang. Just give me a reason to leave. It's sounding a little bit boxy. Give me a reason to leave, bang. Just give me a reason to live. Not quite, um, not quite kind of like muddy, a little bit higher than that. I'm thinking, yeah, somewhere between 500 and 1K. And that's enough of a range to kind of identify a problem. And then we can go in and ideally you say, okay, well, I'm gonna start by just cutting at 730 hertz. Give me a reason to leave. 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 And there you go. That's exactly the kind of the quality that I was hearing. And um, I guessed right. But I don't always. So either way you just want to start that process and you don't have to literally start out saying i'm going to cut exactly this and if you're wrong you just stop the mix close the door like walk out the door <laughs> anything like that but start just thinking more intentionally and at least having a rough idea even if it's just for now just too much low end low mids upper mids or top end something like that because then at least you know roughly where you're starting and you have an intention so mixing tip number 13 is what i call fearless compression and I think a lot of people are afraid of compressing too aggressively but this relates back to this idea of volume balance a lot of the time depending on the genre um, a lot of the time everything is just so locked into place that quite often if your mixes sound amateur or they don't have that professional quality it's because the dynamics are just all, all over the place and that could be a combination of not using enough volume automation not using enough limiting clipping we're going to come back to that in a second but a big big part of that is compression now if you're mixing rock music um that's going to be an even bigger part compared to if you're mixing you know jazz or um classical then you're probably going to rely more on like volume balancing volume automation pop music definitely quite a lot of compression as well so don't be afraid of using quite you know a lot of compression it's really really hard to over compress something in my opinion and normally when we talk about over compression it's more in relation to the genre so if you really heavily compress a jazz mix yeah you could say that's over compression if you're mixing like rock or pop though especially vocals it's it's hard to over compress and i used to say that if you use fast attack times, you need to be more careful. But actually, you know, I'm not so sure about that now either. If you use fast attack times, you're gonna get a slightly different characteristic. Um, you're gonna get a thicker sound. Compared to slow attack times, you're gonna get a punchier sound. But 
you know, that's just different sounds. It's not necessarily over compressed. And I'm gonna just kind of show you here um, how much compression I'm using on this vocal. So this is already locked into place pretty well. And I, like I said, I did this in the mix prep phase. So I actually went through and soloed all of the channels before I even started mixing um, to do this. But first of all, we've got Vocal Rider. And what this does is actually just turns the volume up and down. So it's like a compressor that doesn't change the, the, the sound of it by you know, messing with the kind of attack time and release time, you can change the sound of something using compression. Vocal Rider doesn't do that, it's just turning it up and down. And then we've got um, some clipping and we'll come back to that. And then Arvox, so this is the, the compressor that I'm using. And without. Some of the words are just too quiet and we're, we're kind of losing intelligibility but also it just doesn't have that finished sound and this is a, not a heavy rock track or anything this is you know it's bordering on jazz it's kind of like jazz rock um, but it still is necessary to have you can see nearly 12 dB of gain reduction just to like lock it into place where I want it. So don't be afraid of compressing quite aggressively. Just be somewhat aware of the genre that you're working with. Um, I would just say it's a lot easier to under compress, way, way easier to under compress than it is to over compress. And if you're, if you're worried, um, then just make sure you use a lot of compressors that uh, have fixed attack and release times because often when things start to sound kind of bad because of compression it's because of like a way too fast attack time or a way too slow release time and everything starts to sound really like pokey because we're using slow attack times or everything sounds really thick because we're using fast attack times but if you use something like Arvox on vocals where it literally doesn't have an attack or release control it's going to help you kind of hedge your bets a little bit and make sure you're not doing anything too crazy um, but don't be afraid of it and then Tip number 14 is to not neglect clipping and limiting. So again, this all comes back to, surprise, surprise, volume balancing. Um, but at the end of the day, compression alone often isn't enough. So on this vocal here, we've already seen that I had vocal rider and compression, but I'm also using a clipper. And what clipping does is it just shaves off the transient. So a compressor is gonna turn it down. It's not actually messing with the, you know, the transient itself. And that's, the transient is this little part, the kind of the initial, the initial um, part of the waveform where it comes in. And with vocals, that's often like the consonant at the start of the word. Um, transient, t transient, that's the trans, T is the transient of the word transient. <laughs> so what a limiter will do or a compressor will do, same thing, um, just different ratios, is turn it down really quickly. What a clipper will do is actually, it will actually just cut it off. So that's kind of the theory of it. So if you can imagine here, a, a limiter will turn this down, whereas a, a clipper will just cut off this transient. And that sounds really aggressive, but what it does is it, it just catches those louder peaks, tames it and gives us more headroom to work with. Um, but I tend to just dial it in in terms of the kind of the practical advice now, I dial it in until we're just catching the occasional transient. So you can see it's not every word, and this is a great plug-in T-Rack uh, Classic Clipper. It's not every word, um, but we're just, you know, catching it every now and then. And then equally limiting. So limiters aren't just for your mix bus, use them on individual channels and you can do the same thing. And I even sometimes find myself using limiting more than compressing on individual channels. I can think of a, a jazz track I was mixing recently where I didn't want that compressed sound. I didn't want to kind of manipulate the, the dynamics too much, but there were just some notes that were just way too loud. So I just put on a clip, uh, sorry, I just put on a limiter to catch those louder transients. 
and I use something like this, uh, fab filter limiter in safe mode, or you just want a transparent limiter to just catch those. And I could go through and volume automate it, it would just take way, much, you know, way too long. So you just use a limiter, tune it so you're just catching those louder peaks and then it's quite transparent more transparent than a compressor but a lot of people th seem to think that limiting is more aggressive but it just depends how you use it so you can see i'm only doing you know 1.7 decibels i could get away with a lot more than that um as long as you're not pushing it so hard that it's distorting or anything like that it should be relatively transparent depending on what limiter you're using but don't neglect clipping and limiting they're really handy tools on individual instruments when you're mixing mixing tip number 15 is to close your eyes so i'm not going to spend long on this one um but everything you see on screen all of these tools nowadays have a ton of visual feedback it's going to influence how you hear things and if you've ever listened to music uh, with a music video and then listen to the same song later on, it sounds completely different. And it's because the visuals influence you. And that's when we're talking about a music video. There's not kind of a representation of the audio on screen. It's literally just, you know, some pretty imagery <laughs> often. But when we have tools that are actually showing us what's happening with the audio on screen, it manipulates it even more so. Um, so I just find it, you know, I find myself closing my eyes a lot when I'm tweaking EQs or the thing I do the most is like bypass, unbypass. I'll close my eyes. I'll press this a really random number of times. So I don't know if it's bypassed or unbypassed and then I'll flick it on and off and I'll try and hear um, the difference and make sure I follow through on the intent that I had. And then I can also decide which do I prefer. And it's just so much easier. And and also sometimes you can't even tell which one's which and you say, oh, okay, this is bypass. And then you open your eyes and you know, it's actually not bypass. So that's a really handy tip. Mixing tip number 16 is to mix in four dimensions. So if you close your eyes and you think of the mix, you don't have to close your eyes to do this, but it makes it easier. You wanna think in kind of four dimensions and it makes it easier to visualize the mix and then translate that into how it sounds so we've got height which is frequency so higher frequencies um, sound like they're coming from above us lower frequencies sound like they're coming from below we have width which is panning just left to right and then we have depth which is front to back and often that's just volume so if things are louder they sound nearer if they're quieter they sound further away but we can also play with reverb if we add more reverb it pushes things back in the mix we can play with uh, transient shaping so with compressors if we use a fast attack time um, and we kind of dull the transient by using a fast attack time that will have the impact of pushing it back in the mix as well whereas you know more pokey um, you know if we use a slow attack time to enhance the transient, that'll bring it forward. So often with vocals, we wanna make sure there's more of a transient. Backing vocals though, we might wanna use a faster attack time to push them back in the mix. So I'm not gonna demonstrate this a ton because we're kind of running out of time here now, but play around with depth. It's a really important aspect. I find, you know, height is pretty simple. In terms of frequencies, we th think more in terms of just having a, a good balance or just, you know, at least an intentional balance between low end, top end, that kind of stuff. Width with panning is pretty easy. But with depth, I find a lot of people, that's the thing that's holding them back from getting to that advanced level is they're not using enough reverb delays. Um, and even, you know, another way is like cutting high frequencies to push things back in the mix and really just intentionally um, cutting things that don't need top end. Mixing tip number 17 is to know what matters. There's a lot of stuff that you hear about on YouTube and all over the place that really isn't important. And a lot of this is highly subjective. And that's a point we're gonna come back to in a second. But I just wanna run through a few things here that are really commonly misunderstood or there's a lot of debate around and just kind of set the record in terms of you know, whether or not they matter. The first thing is using the solo button. So um, you'll see a lot of videos that say, you know, avoid the solo button. And I've so, you know, spoke about this on the past and made videos about this, but I think people take it way too you know, literally and then they never use the solo button. But when it comes to that, like really it just depends. I use the solo button and often it's just the thing you want to avoid is making decisions with the solo button on. So for example, if we were mixing this track here, we could solo the vocals and say, okay, we need to find, um, you know, we want to add more top end, for example, um, if we have a listen. Give me a reason to leave. We could still solo. Give me a reason to leave, baby. 
and kind of find what we like and then just check it in the context in the mix. And as long as you're making decisions in the whole mix, um, you're gonna be all right. So listen to the mix, figure out something that he's fixing. Then if you need to go and solo to kind of like fine tune it, fine. And then just double check it um, without using solo. Another thing is top down mixing. We've already kind of touched on that. Um, but I find that if you are too aggressive on the mix bus, then you can end up removing good stuff from things that um, are fine. So. Let me give you an example here. What I'm hearing is there's there's a lot of kind of low mid build up, give me a reason to leave. and especially yeah, you know, it's kind of like wah, 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 wah. again, it's that like nasally quality around like probably more like 500, and that's mostly in the guitars if you have a listen. Give me a reason to leave. Just turn this on. So if we were doing top-down mixing, we would then say, okay, I'm gonna cut 500 and hold the mix. And while it did help, it also, you know, affected some other things. It affected everything. And may now the drums have less 500 hertz and maybe that's not what we want. Give me a reason. Like we lost some body on the snare, for example. Have a listen. Give me a reason to leave, babe. Just give me a reason to leave. The snare sounds a lot brighter now. Give me a reason to leave, babe. Just give me a reason. So while it may have fixed the problem in the guitars. Give me a it's you know it's negatively affected other things in a way that we might not want so i often find that it's just not enough again it, it leaves with intent if the whole mix has got a problem if the whole mix is too dark too bright um then then the mix bus would be a good place to do it also the mix bus is a great place for compression mix bus compression does something that you can't do in any other way you can't you know achieve the same outcome as mix bus compression by adding compression on one of the subgroups but when it comes to something like eq it's just really risky. And I've been a proponent of this in the past because it does allow you to move a lot faster. And when you're starting out, sometimes it can be easier to make those big broad strokes and you can do more kind of um, aggressive top down mixing or kind of EQ on your mix bus when you're starting out, if it just helps you mix quicker and actually get mixes done. But as you get more intermediate, more advanced, you wanna be really careful with something like that. Another thing that um, a lot of people talk about is high pass filtering and high passing everything and it's just unnecessary. I, I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube about this um, and so many people talk about this and it, it's just unnecessary. If something has some kind of low end mud, then clean it up with a high pass filter, but you don't need to go through and high pass every single channel. Something else is mixing in mono and I do this you know, quite a lot. I'll flip the mix to mono. And I might mix in mono for 10, 15 minutes and then flip in and out again. But I used to try and follow this rule that people prescribe where it's like, no, you should mix in mono all the time. It's, you know, it's really helpful. And therefore you have to do it you know, every single time for the whole mix or, you know, at least a big duration of the mix. But there's plenty of mixers who do the complete opposite. And I, you know, I use it as a tool every now and then, but don't feel like you have to mix in mono the whole time. It is just helpful. And you want to at least check your mix in mono. And I still use it as a tool to make sure I'm getting a good balance between the instruments without relying on panning alone. So that when I sum to mono, I'm using EQ to kind of create space for everything in the mix. Um, but it's not essential that you do it the whole time. Another one is magic frequencies. A lot of people say, you know, boost this frequency on 
kick and it will it will sound great or do this but i think it's better to train your ears and kind of come up with your own magic frequencies and let the music guide you and over time you'll come up with your own tastes and preferences as a mixer as well so your magic frequencies will be different to someone else's magic frequencies so you don't want to just get like a, an eq cheat sheet and use that as a way of um, deciding what's eq instead just you know think of the whole frequency spectrum and train your ears so that you can actually identify problems develop your own taste it's kind of like um you know when i was learning scales on bass guitar i could have learned every single scale by memory for example if i wanted to know okay like half diminished i could learn um or, or even if it was a scale where it's like this scale's got a flat nine i could learn every single flat nine scale or i could just learn you know what flat nine means and i could play a normal scale um but just flatten the ninth it's kind of like that instead of memorizing all of these magic frequencies just learn the underlying kind of principles and then you create you can create your own magic frequencies so um the last thing is gain staging so you don't need to obsess over making sure that every channel is perfect for example we could have um everything like massively clipping on an internal channel as long as the stereo out isn't clipping it's fine so if i add 20 db here on our mix bus and then i cut 20 db here on the master out Give me a reason to leave. it says this is clipping But it's fine Give me a reason to leave. now as long as your output isn't clipping if your output was clipping then you've got an issue for example here if we leave that on and there's not actually an easy way for me to show you this because it's gonna uh, it's gonna be ridiculously too loud but if your output was clipping then that would be an issue but internally you don't need everything to be perfect and it said gain staging is just um, you know, there are reasons to do it. For example, on this vibraphone, without gain staging, it's just pretty quiet. So adding 15 dB of gain brings it up so that I don't have to just crank up the volume fader. And if it's you know way too quiet and you have to turn up volume fader and then you max out the volume fader, that's an issue. And also the resolution changes as you go lower, the resolution is lower. So you want it to be in that kind of area, but you can see I've only got you know one gain plugin, two, three on the whole mix. So you don't need to obsess over gain staging. I think a lot of people you know give it way too much attention. So mixing tip number 18 is objective versus subjective. And this is going to get a little bit more philosophical now that we've covered a lot of the practical stuff. I want to talk um, about kind of the big picture because this is what will help you learn really quickly as opposed to just, um, you know, get a few tips and tricks. Understanding kind of the mindset of how you learn mixing will, will help you progress a lot quicker. Now, objective versus subjective, what I'm talking about there is um, the two different aspects of music production. So a lot of people think of it as, as one thing, but there's actually two different aspects. There's the objective side, which is kind of the technical scientific side of music production and mixing and mastering and all of it. And then there's the subjective, which is the kind of creative, emotional, uh, more musical side of music production. Now, different people use different terms. So Dave Pensado, and I won't play the video to save time, but if you want, you can look it up. This video here, he talks about the importance of dif differentiating between technical and emotional mixing. Jack Joseph Puig talks about intellect and instinct. And then Manny Marikin talks about left brain, right brain. And these, if you don't know who these people are, these are incredible mixers with, you know, tens of Grammys between them, some of the best known mixers in the entire industry. And they all talk about this distinction. And the language that we use um, at mastering.com is objective, subjective. So what I wanna do now is kind of talk about how these two things interact. Now, when it comes to the subjective, I actually think it's quite helpful to lean into it. So 
the reason why a lot of people disagree about mixing and one person will say one thing like oh you should you know really heavily compress your vocals and then someone else will say something different like oh no you shouldn't compress your vocals too much is because it's completely subjective there is no right or wrong answer there is no um ought there is no you should do this in the mixing process because it's an artistic process there is no right or wrong now that can be overwhelming at the same time because if you don't have an idea of what you're doing or there is no right or wrong answer there are no rules then where the hell do you start what the hell do you do and there's kind of two solutions to that one is to try and make the process more objective by using references and by pulling in references you're not pulling in like this is a objectively good or you know right mix but you are pulling in a good example of what people generally um, think is a good sounding mix. There's consensus that this is a good sounding mix or someone with a lot more experience than you has decided this is a good sounding mix. So it gives you a measuring stick and helps you kind of measure. But another way is to lean into subjectivity and recognize that a lot of mixing is actually to do with emotions and the way that you decide what to do in the mixing process is by thinking about the emotion of the track. So I'll give you like a really quick example here um, in this track, Reason to Leave. So the chorus is quite upbeat, but the verse is pretty chill. Seeking in my heart It's more than I can bear But I, th I think it needs a little bit more oomph. So what I could do is I could use um, I could use a variety of tools to give the chorus more kind of just make it sound a bit more upbeat, like they're going for it a little bit more. One of those is I could have some volume automation to just make that first hit of the chorus louder. Um, something else is mix bus compression. And if I want it to sound more upbeat, then I'm probably going to go for a slower attack time because that's going to exaggerate the transient which is going to make it sound like they're playing harder versus a fast attack time which is going to kind of thicken it out so this is just you know a good example of using okay there is no right or wrong fast attack time slow attack time like both could work so how do I decide which to use? Well, you know, what is the song telling me it needs? What emotions do I want to bring out? And we can lean into that subjectivity and that emotional side of music to guide our decisions. But so we can tune in this compressor. So we have a fast attack time. Give me a reason to leave. It brings out the body of the drums. Give me a reason to leave. And it thickens everything up, whereas we have a slow attack time. Give me a reason to leave. Just give me a reason to leave. Give me a reason to leave. sounds like he's hitting the drums more aggressively and you can hear it in uh the vocal as well sounds like he's spitting out the words a bit more, more just give me a reason so that's a just a quick example of using emotions as our guide and leaning into subjectivity um but like i said you can also pull in references to kind of make the mixing process more objective and have something to strive towards and then mixing tip number 20 is in terms of the order that you learn these. And this is something that, you know, if you watch these videos from Manny Marikin, Jack Joseph Puig, uh, Dave Fonsado, they talk about the distinction between these two things. But what they don't talk about is what order to learn them in. And in my opinion, this is a very you know, strong opinion. It's basically what we've built the whole <laughs> company around um, as an education company is learning the objective first. And the, the easiest way to think about this is once you have the technical skills under your belt, it's a lot easier to be creative. Whereas if you try to be creative when you don't have technical skills, you get sucked out of that state of creative flow because you might think, oh, the, here's, here's a good idea I have. Here's something I want to do you know, in this when you're producing or in this mix. And then you reach for a tool 
and you load up a compressor like this and you think what the hell is this <laughs> what do what you know I, I have a rough idea of what attack time and release time does but I, i'm not really sure what to do in this context i have no idea what all these other controls do um you probably you know if you don't have an understanding of the kind of basic principles of compression it's going to be even harder whereas if you have the technical skills under your belt and it's kind of like it's like having scales on an instrument under your fingertips then when it comes to creating you're like you don't have to think about that stuff you can just stay in a state of of creative flow so it makes a lot more sense to learn the technical first and master the objective and then use that as the lens that you look through the entire process at now mastering of all of the processes is the most subjective part of the you know the music production cycle so songwriting is you know extremely subjective producing is extremely subjective mixing as we start to bring in some objectivity we're leveraging more kind of technical tools but we're still using them in a very subjective way but then when we get to mastering we're mostly just looking at what's the sonic footprint of the song what are the dynamics what's the volume and um, we're being very scientific and we can actually measure it we can lean on you know spectral tools and visual analyzers a lot more to actually look at the mix because because we're looking at it on a kind of more scientific scale so this is why um it makes sense to start with mastering learn mastering first not only does that give you that end in mind perspective where you know where you're going but it also helps you master the objective because it's the most kind of objective technical part of the entire process and get to grips with eq compression all of these tools and think in a way that's highly technical scientific and objective so that then when you get onto mixing and, and producing it's it's easy those skills are under your belt it's those kind of technical skills become instinctual you don't have to think about them you can just do so we'll come back to that in a second but mixing tip number one 21 <laughs> not number one is get clear on what's holding you back now a lot of people are stuck um and i don't think they know why they're stuck they're at that intermediate plateau they've been doing this for a while um, and their mixes still don't sound professional or they're just not happy with the quality of their mixes but they don't know, really know where they're going wrong youtube's not helping so the first question to ask when you you're feeling stuck is what problems are you actually experiencing like what what is happening what is the issue and thinking back to when i was learning if i asked myself this question it was a case of not being able to actually translate the sound that i had in my head into the speakers and even then the sound that i did have in my head was very amorphous i had a rough idea but i wasn't completely clear and then when i would actually try and achieve that it would it would fall apart and then i'd take the mix out of the car kind of going full circle here and it'd always be extremely demoralizing hit and play listen to it in the car thinking this sounded great i can't wait to hear it sounds in the car and, and it just like sucks and then the next thing was just frustration like why can't i do this why is this so difficult why where am i going wrong i have no idea um why is nothing i'm trying working um you know what should i focus on it's extremely overwhelming but you really have to ask like okay well let me actually drill down here what problems am i experiencing because where your mind will take you is i'm not good enough i'm not talented enough the fact that I can't achieve the sound in my head means I can't even start a career in music. So maybe this just isn't for me. Maybe I'm broken. But that's the kind of the emotional side. But if you actually break it down to, okay, well, what's the problem I'm experiencing? Um, first of all, you're going to think, okay, well, either there's a specific thing that I know I'm struggling with, like EQ or compression, or maybe the problem is that you don't know. And just getting clarity on that is, is really helpful. It's okay to not know what the problem is, but now you kind of do know what the problem is. The problem is that you don't know, so um, you probably need some guidance. The second question you need to ask is, what are the consequences of these problems? Because once you get clear on the consequences, first of all, it will just give you the motivation to actually go th and solve those problems, but it will help you figure out which problems to focus on first. So um, if we just talk about you know, the fact that a lot of people are unhappy with their mixes well first and foremost it just doesn't feel good it's extremely frustrating but it also means um you know they might not be releasing music um and 
you know, they're not actually finishing tracks and uploading them, so no one's hearing their music. Or it could be that they are uploading music, but it's not getting any traction because it just doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound professional. People, you know, go on Spotify, they're listening to, you know, lots of professionally produced music, and then they listen to, um, you know, listen to someone's music that's not produced as well, and they're just going to ignore it. The production gets in the way. They could, can't hear the song because the production becomes an obstacle. Therefore, they're not getting any traction with clients. Um, because they don't have like a good portfolio if they are looking to work with other people um, or you know, sync and licensing libraries. Again, it's just kind of all these knock on impacts. So when you start to get clear on, okay, the consequence of that problem is pretty significant, then it, it helps give you A, the motivation to actually solve that, but B, it helps focus you because if, you're, if you are a, an independent artist, there's so many things you could do. You could focus on marketing, you could focus on songwriting, you could focus on mixing and producing. So this will just help you figure out, okay, for you at this point in time, what are the consequences of not being able to you know, produce a track that sounds the way you want? And um, you know, are those consequences significant enough that this is the thing you need to focus on instead of any of the other you know, thousand things that you could be doing? And then the last question, you need to ask is why do these problems exist? And that's when you start to actually be able to solve um, these problems by getting clear on what's causing them in the first place. And I can I can give some perspective here because I think it's it's hard to know this when you're learning like why why you might be struggling with this or why um, you know you don't feel like you're progressing, why you're stuck at the intermediate plateau. Um, I've been there, but I've also had the experience of taking you know, hundreds, thousands of people through that process. So I have a, a lot of, you know, clarity on why these problems exist. And first and foremost, I think YouTube is, is a major problem. It's weird because I've, you yeah, know, I've been part of causing that. I have a lot of YouTube videos, but the issue is the algorithm and the way the algorithm works forces you to create, um, you, you kind of have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. You have to do tips and tricks. You have to keep it very practical. It has to be fun and sexy. It has to be easily consumed and you're competing with Mr. Beast. <laughs> so it can't be, you know, long and drawn out. Generally, you know, more philosophical stuff doesn't work. Um, and you're optimizing for views naturally. Um, otherwise, you know, it's what's, what's the point of making videos? And it's this constant battle. So that's, that's part of the problem. That's why there's this proliferation of like tips and tricks. And it's just like a, an echo chamber where everyone on YouTube is saying the same thing, but it's not actually helping. Um, and at the same time, it's going to pull you into a hole where, um, you know, you're watching YouTube videos and then you get distracted by a Mr. Beast video or something like that. So YouTube is definitely part of the problem. I also think traditional education is part of the problem on the other end of the spectrum. If you go to, you know, I, I won't name any names, but if you go to a college or a university to do music production, um, you'll probably be disappointed. I know a lot of people are. Personally, I had a really bad experience at, at university and just didn't learn anything. Everything I've learned has been self-taught or learned from you know, actual engineers out in the real world. So the issue with education now is it hasn't really kept up with the fact that now um, the entire process, mixing, mastering, producing is being done by one person. And we don't have this kind of distributed process like the industry used to be where, you know, someone writes a song, then someone records it and someone else mixes it, someone else masters it. And you have a producer overlooking a lot of that. And there's all these different roles. Now it's often, you know, one person, you doing all of that. So I don't think colleges have really kept up to that. Um, but either way, the, the, whole, the whole point of going to college is to get a, a certification. And that's just not going to help you in this industry. They're going to, you know, you're going to spend two or three years doing a degree spending upwards of sixty thousand dollars just to be spat out at the end with no real kind of roadmap for turning any of it into a career so i, I won't go into this too much but um there is one more problem and i think that it's the colleges are teaching forwards they're teaching producing and they're teaching a lot of that and then mastering is an afterthought and we'll come back to that in a second now, another common problem is just, you know, the proliferation of plug-in and gear companies now as well. They, you know, are constantly selling you the next plug-in that's going to fix your mixes. But if you bought enough plugins, you know that's not the case. And another th problem, I, I think another reason why people really struggle is they don't have feedback. They're kind of on their own in their studio. They don't have a community that they're part of. They don't have a, um, a mentor who can actually listen to their music and tell them what they're doing wrong. So they just kind of end up in this kind of, endless cycle of just trying things and not having enough of an outside influence to give them a level of discernment about where they're going wrong 
Now, with all that being said, if we go another level deeper and we say, okay, well, you know, YouTube algorithm, traditional education, plugin companies, you know, lack of feedback, all of these things are holding people back. And then we ask, okay, but what are they holding them back from? What's the thing that people aren't getting from those, um, you know, those learning avenues? And that's where, in my opinion, and this is a very strong opinion because we've built the whole company around this, it comes back to this idea of mastery of the technical and starting with the objective, not the subjective like everyone else does. So anywhere else you learn, you'll probably start learning production and you'll be stuck in that world of subjectivity. You'll never get true mastery over the technical tools, which means you'll constantly hit that roadblock and you don't learn to, to create a distinction between the, the technical and the creative. Whereas when you learn mastering first, you're learning the technical, you're getting those technical skills under your belt, they're the scales under your fingertips, so that A, you actually know what's going on in the music production process, because effectively, you know, it's engineering, it's called engineering for the reason it is highly scientific. And a lot of people think that's the boring part, but actually it's, it's really fun. And we find that students who are highly creative come and work with us. And even though they're focusing on some like, you know, scientific -y things, it's still very practical, it's still very hands-on. It's still just a case of really understanding EQ, compression, frequency, dynamics, volume, the bare bones of you know, mixing and mastering. It's understanding those things, leveraging those things. It's not like we're gonna you know, expect people to go and read books and, and study a bunch of theory and physics or anything like that. But with those avenues of learning, people aren't getting enough of an objective understanding, a technical understanding, to then move through to the subjective phase. And that's still the goal. The goal is still to get to the point where you can create and you can create in a state of flow and you can just you know, have a sound in your head, have an idea and just translate it into the world perfectly. That's still the goal, but the bridge to get there is mastery of the technical. And nobody's getting that in any of these other places because everyone is either teaching production chronologically, starting with you know, songwriting, producing, then mixing, then mastering. And that means mastering gets the least attention or they're just not teaching it at all or it's just you know everyone's saying different things and you get caught in the whirlwind of one person saying this someone else saying this because it is all totally subjective without seeing the kind of the common the commonality underneath which is the technical and then being able to see actually that person doesn't know what they're talking about or i can see why those two people disagree on this because it is subjective so to me that's why a lot of people are struggling why they get stuck why they have these problems is a lack of mastery over the objective that's preventing them from moving through to the purely subjective and that state of total creative flow so this is the entire philosophy and idea behind our core program the reverse engineer and you probably knew this was coming so if you're not interested in hearing about this um, you're not interested in working with us you can just yeah you can go ahead and leave this video now but what i want to do is for anyone who is watching that wants to go to the next step obviously this has been quite a long uh, workshop but there's only so much we can do in you know in an hour or so so if you want to keep going and you want to learn more about this and you want to start you know working with us and solving some of these problems then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the reverse engineer and we'll spend a few minutes going through this. So this is a 29 week program that teaches the entire production process in reverse. We start with mastering, then we teach mixing, then we teach production. So we teach all three, it's eight weeks on mastering and then a week or two on how to go out and get mastering clients if you wanna do that. Then eight weeks on mixing, so it's a full program on each of these. And then again, uh, another week or two, uh, just going into the process of going out and getting mixing clients. And then finally production. And in the production phase, we've now moved into the purely subjective. So we start with mastering and we focus on the technical skills. So then we move into m mixing. And mixing is really easy to learn when you're good at mastering because you don't need to relearn EQ compression. So we can actually teach it in a way that's a lot more nuanced and, and quicker as well. And then finally, when it gets to production, we really focus on codifying emotion and taking something highly amorphous like letting emotion guide the music making process and codifying it and actually breaking that down into okay well how do technical terms like you know fast and slow attack time actually translate into emotion how do they impact the emotion of a track how does a thin versus a thick arrangement affect the emotion how do all of these technical things ultimately end up 
influencing the listener's experience of hearing the song. So we go through everything and that's eight weeks on production as well. And like I said, throughout that, there's training on how to go out and get clients if you wanna do that as well to support yourself while you're pursuing a longer term career um, as an independent artist. So in a nutshell, over the span of 29 weeks, um, you'll become a professionally trained marshalling engineer, mixing engineer and producer. You'll experience a breakthrough in the quality of your music and you're gonna get way more satisfaction from both the music creation process itself, but also more satisfaction from the final result. And my goal is that when you take a mix out to the car in 29 weeks, you first of all, you know exactly what it's gonna sound like. You don't have to kind of make that, that jump, that guess. You know what it's gonna sound like already. You know it's gonna translate. But secondly, you take it out to your car and you hit play and it brings a smile to your face. That's my goal more than anything else. And then of course, from that point, it depends where you wanna go. We have students who go on to build mixing and mastering businesses. We have students who go on to uh, produce for other people full-time. We have students who focus on their own career as an artist. We have other students who are just hobbyists who are just doing this um, for the love of music. But 29 weeks from now, that's my goal. So very quickly, just to show that this isn't theory, that um, you know this works. I wanna talk about some of our alumni um, who have worked with you know artists like John Mayer, The Shins, Elbow, Lil Wayne, and even the late Frank Zappa. Um, I won't name names just for the sake of privacy, but we have you know someone in this program who worked very closely with Frank Zappa. So this is the level of quality that we have inside the program. And um, we also have students who have worked with Coke, Cadillac, Intel, Airbnb, Disney, Netflix, in terms of getting sync placements or you know writing, composing music for these brands. So it's a very high standard. And now to make this very, very tangible, I'm just gonna show you some before or after examples. So this is how their music sounded before, how it sounded after, and then also just a few words from um, each of these people on you know, what it's like going through this experience. When I listened to this mix I released a year ago this month, I cringe at the sound of it. It's not uh, professional. I question why I ever released it. The difference is obvious. The, the new mix is much better than the old mix. I'm extremely um, satisfied with the new mix. I'm going to release this in an album, and I'm happy with the way things have turned out. Awesome. So I'm always blown away by the difference there. So that just to clarify, same track, no editing on any of these whatsoever. I literally just pulled in the track into the video editing software, did nothing to it. So everything you're hearing is coming from them. And it's the same track, but listen to how much more the artistic vision comes across. It's not just about achieving you know, a good sound. It's about translating the intent of the song and making sure that the listener is just sucked in and they hear it to its fullest potential and it has the best impacts it can have on the listener and yeah it's crazy how much of a difference good production can make to that process so let's listen to one more this one's a bit more of a modern track When I listened to the old mix I did on this, it just 
makes me feel a little embarrassed. My room wasn't treated and I wasn't using the VSX headphones like I am now. So there's a lot of mistakes in there. And yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. The new mix is better. Um, not really to my liking. The client wanted it to sound the way that it does and is happy with it. But yeah, that's uh, that's how I feel about my old mix. Embarrassed. This The new one's much better. So if this is resonating with you at all and you're interested in learning more about the program and just speaking to someone on our team, this isn't something you can just go and sign up. We're very selective about who we work with. We work very closely with every single person. We have a very you know, small, close-knit community that we want to protect and make sure that everyone coming to that is going to be a positive addition. So the first step is to submit an application. And below this video, you'll see a link where you can click to go to a page. On that page, um, you start the application process, you answer a few questions. It will take a, you know three to five minutes in total. And then once you've done that, it will take you to another page where you pick a time slot to speak to somebody on our team. And I'll talk about that in a second, but once you've done that, the next step is just keep an eye out for a text or a call from your advisor that's assigned to you. And we have a whole team of professional engineers who are trained to uh, you know, go through this process with people and advise them on what to do next, whether they're a good fit for the program, if not point them in the right direction. You'll hear from your advisor and they'll want to confirm the call with you. And if you don't confirm that, then we remove it from the calendar. So just make sure you look out for that communication, that email or that call. So assuming your application is accepted and you confirm your call, then you'll get on a 45 minute Zoom meeting with your advisor and they're just gonna really dig in and try to understand you and your music on a much deeper level to first of all, see if it's a good fit um, to figure out you know, what you should do and help you get more clarity on what your problems are, what your goals are. And then if it is a good fit, we can talk about the reverse engineer um, and only if it makes sense for you, only if you wanna go there, we can talk about it. We're not gonna be super pushy or anything like that. But then finally, if it's not a good fit or it's just not good timing, then we'll either point you in the right direction and say, hey, you should go check this out or here's some other resources we have or here's you know, um, uh, you know other companies that have great resources we think you'd like. Or uh, we'll give you a plan as well. We'll give you like a roadmap and say, hey, well, go do this, go do this, go do this. And then maybe let's talk again in a few months, anything like that. So we're not going to be pushy because like I said, we only want the right people. Um, and just as kind of like proof of this, here's a screenshot from our Trustpilot page where Alex says, I was curious about the program. So I was able to call and talk with Jay, who was so kind of helpful. She even recommended that I not do the program because of what I had going on, but still gave me some practical next steps for what I should do. My impression was that Jay was not trying to sell me something, but actually wanted to help me along my journey in music. I felt inspired. Um, and when I'm already enabled, I can't wait to come back and join the program. So the only kind of qualifier I'll add here is that this is only for people who are very serious about this. If you're you know, committed to turning your music around and reaching that quality that you want to reach and achieving that sound in your head, if you're really, really serious about that and you're willing to put in the work, because this is not a short program, it's fun, it's extremely fun. The community is awesome, but it is a lot of hard work and we're there to support you along the way and hold you accountable. But if you're not gonna do the work, then there's no point coming on board. So we only want people who are really serious about this and really invested into the process and serious about music. That's really all it comes down to. So we are quite uh, selective about that and we do disqualify a lot of the applications we get. If you don't get approved, please don't be offended. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or anything like that. It just means it's not a good fit for where you're at in your music or your music production right now. And that doesn't mean you know we couldn't work together later or anything like that, but we do have to be quite selective. We only have so many positions that we can fill each month. Um, when it comes to taking these calls. So yeah, let's talk. Let's just have a conversation. Worst case, this call is free. You're gonna get um, you know, a roadmap for what you need to do. You're gonna get a ton of clarity on what to do in the next few months in order to reach your goals. And it's basically free advice from somebody who's been doing this for years and has helped hundreds of people just like you. So that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, there is a good fit. We dig in, you want to explore the program. We think it's a good fit. We talk about it and you end up joining. And then we work closely with you over the next 29 weeks to help you finally achieve that sound you have in your head and experience that satisfaction of making music that sounds exactly the way you want it. And then, like I said, you can go off and do um, whatever's next for you. So. That's 
that's basically it. Yeah, that's the pitch. <laughs> if you're interested, click the link, fill out the application. Hope to see you soon. If not, thank you so much for watching. I hope you come away from this with a ton of value and I'll see you again soon.